God bless you, brother. Good evening, friends. It's a privilege to be back here again tonight at the at the great rally convention. It's been a great day for us all. I'm sure at great time this morning at fellowship around the Word of God and with the people down at the ministerial breakfast. All we wish you could all have been there. They didn't have, I think, room for the people but uh, to accommodate them, but we just had some grand fellowship. And thank you. Such a grand time among the brethren. Then today's kind of been a, a day for me just to see many of my friends and visit around and they've been seeing the Holy Spirit revealing and showing and making things uh, right. Someone was telling me uh, it's supposed to be a little string laying here or something of a, a little baby that had a waterhead last night that was prayed for. And oh, it was a mammoth big waterhead and it was laying there behind the curtain. When we come in, a little mother and we went over and it kind of touched me to think of the poor little fella, not a chance, just a little thing and his little head was swollen, great big veins sticking out and his little chin and face about that wide and his head about like this. And somehow or another just kneeling there and offering the prayer of faith and laying hands up on the little fella and challenging the devil that done the work. I said to the little mother, you believe? She looked up and she said, I do. I said, there's something happened to the baby. Now, I want you to know this. You go home. She lives away from here. And I said, when you get home, I want you to take a measurement of the baby's head. Then tomorrow, take another measurement. If you can't get back, send it back. Billy just was telling me a few moments ago that they brought the string and the baby's head had shrank in three quarters of an inch. They take it to the doctor the day and they've been giving it shots, I believe, every day. And the, um, and the doctor said it's so much improved they don't need any more shots. And the big veins that was in its head's done gone down, not a vein to be seen. And it just goes to show that he lives. So wonderful. I'm so glad that he answers prayer. So happy for that. And we just know that anybody that will believe it, just believe the Lord, it will, it will happen the same thing to you. See, uh, the head has to, as it goes back, it has to get its position as it shrinks down. And now, if the people cheer that has the little one, but just be faithful to God and the baby will get all right. That's a sign that God heard our prayer. And I'm grateful to God and I'm, I'm thanking God for you, mother and father and uh, relatives and all of the little ones. I know how I'd feel if it had been my child. And I, I can't feel to yours like it would be mine, I'd be telling something wrong because I couldn't feel that, but I do feel for the child with all my heart. We just had time, I like to tell something that happened one time concerning that, a vision that has never come to pass yet, and it will. Amen. The day I went into a room where there was a precious man, the father of five little children, lay dying with a great big uh, cancer. And uh, looking at him, I, he said, the doctor says there's nothing can be done. And he's got a little baby just a few months old. His little wife standing there looking at him, and a fine looking little fella, her husband, and the little baby, I didn't see them. I think they've come all the way from somewhere. So it just, You've got to feel for those people. I think of that little children, five of them now, be without a father. That's the work of the devil. So we, I said, I'm going to take you by faith 
to God's operating room. And I'm going to take God's operating knife sharper than a two-edged sword. We're going right down where that devil's a laying and cut him out with the word. I think the man went on home. He was, was, oh, God is so good. It was my neighbor right where I'm staying. So now, tomorrow morning, the Lord willing, I've been given the privilege or all these fine ministers and teachers that have the Sunday school lesson. And if the Lord willing, I want to speak on in the morning the restoring of the bride tree. And so, if you're not uh, in your own church, while well, we'd be glad to have you out 9.30 or whatever time it is in the morning. Then tomorrow night, we're expecting God to do again the exceedingly abundantly above all that we could do or think. Then we're going down to Brother Bigsby down in South Carolina for two nights, Monday and Tuesday. And then from there, we'll have to go then home in order to get over to the Cow Palace at the West Coast where we go next. Now, just before we approach the Word, let's approach the author while we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. I wonder tonight with our heads bowed and I trust our hearts are too in his presence. How many in here has something on your heart you want God to remember you? Just lift your hand up and say, God, remember me. It's almost a hundred percent. Heavenly Father, it's so good to come to the living God knowing it. He is our great counselor. The Prince of Peace, the mighty God, everlasting Father. And we come in his name tonight before the throne of his grace to ask for all these hands that went up down beneath the hand and the heart of the human being. You know what was there, Father. And it goes to show they have a need and a faith or they would not raise their hands. But they believe, Lord, that the great unseen one is with us. They believe that you would see their hand and know their request. And I'm sure you did, Lord. And behind that request was a prayer. And I'm laying mine with theirs upon your altar. And praying, Lord, that you'll answer each and every one of them. I pray for all the ministers here and their congregations. And we're giving thanks, Lord, for the testimonies already from that one night of prayer for the sick. Begin to come in and the little baby, Lord. Oh, a testimony to the physician. Christ is the head physician. He heals all of our diseases. We're so grateful for that. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with the family. Be with all that's been prayed for and let them just not be nervous and upset, but just wait and remember that ask and then know that it'll be given. God said so. It just can't fail. Grant it, Lord. Bless thy word tonight as we read it in the context of the scripture may be given to us in the power and demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. And when we leave tonight to go to our separate homes and places of dwelling at this time, I pray that it'll be noise along the street and in the cars. Like those who came from Emmaus, when they seen Jesus, what he done after the resurrection, know that he'd done the very same thing after the resurrection that he did before the crucifixion. They knew it was him. For no one could do it like that. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Grant tonight that the Holy Spirit, the resurrected Christ, will talk to every heart. And may he perform and do the things tonight that he did before his crucifixion. That the church may have another assurance that he is risen from the dead and lives forevermore. We ask that in his name. Amen. 
I have two scriptures tonight in mind. I'd like to call your attention to one of them is Proverbs 18, chapter 10, verse. The other is Isaiah 32, 2. And in Proverbs the 18, 10, I would like to read this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And in Isaiah, the 32nd chapter of Isaiah, and beginning with the first and second verse. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, a prince shall rule in judgment, and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest. A river as rivers of water in a dry place as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And I draw from this a little context that I was going to use this morning at the uh, minister's breakfast. Just a little context that I would thought might help us all because I think it's fitting. I'm calling it letting off the pressure. I've been thinking that, you know, we're living in a day when there's a lot of pressure. And I try to always think on something that would help the people that come to listen to the Word. If I just stand here and I have no eloquence of speech, I, I'm not an educated person, and I have no uh, ecclesiastical training, therefore the only thing I can do is study and pray and just follow the leading of the Spirit, asking God to do something for us that would help us. That's why we're all here tonight. Not to be seen, but to be helped. And that's our purpose. That's what the convention's purpose is, is to be, is to help someone make life a little easier. And this great day that we're living where there is so much pressure, everything seems to be pressurized. Such a hard time. Everybody's Hurrying just as fast as they can go down the street at 90 miles an hour through every speed zone of its 20, they go 90 anyhow. Shouldn't do that. Christians shouldn't. He must give Caesar what's Caesar's. God's what's God. But here we go, just as hard as we can. Russian just, and we're so nervous. I don't believe real Christians do this. But many of them just light one cigarette after another. What's the matter? You think that helps you? It only makes you more nervous. But you do it. The doctors will write articles and put them in the, the magazines and said cancer by the carload, telling you how dangerous it is to smoke them. And, but you do it anyhow. What's the matter? You're trying to let off the pressure. We find people drink, get out, run around, crowds around, and then try to drink it off. I guess they think that's the thing they should do. That don't let off the pressure. That builds up the pressure. Amen. Going at the wrong thing, wrong way. Then they'll go out and do everything they can to whether it's right or wrong and, and sin and try to hide from it and, and think you're doing something great. What you trying to do? You're trying to hide from something. You know you're wrong. No man can do wrong but what he knows he's doing wrong. Very nature in him. Though he be a fallen man, he's a fallen son of God. There's something in him that tells him that it's wrong. No man can run with another man's wife. Not he knows it's wrong. 
No man can get drunk unless he knows it's wrong. No woman can wear immoral clothes but what she knows it's wrong. You can't do those things. But what do you do? You're trying to let off a pressure. All twisted up, wound up. It's just simply a neurotic age that we're living in. It's the, it's the time that we're living. Pressure. I was speaking about here not long ago being in Africa, watching a little lamb out from where the natives had a little corral and they let the little fella out and he was grazing. And all at once he got real nervous and I thought, what's the matter with the little guy? But as I watched, he couldn't see it, but in the distance there was a great big yellow mane lion slipping up through the grass. He smelt the little lamb and was making his way to him. See, he was just nervous. He didn't know why. Sometimes we call it premonition. Now, the reason he was nervous, he didn't see the lion, but just something he knew that death was lurking near. The world seems to be in that same condition. Know that something is lingering near. Something's fixing to happen. It builds up a pressure, of course, to the sinner. But the Christian who's instructed in the Word ought to know that that's the coming of the Lord. Amen. It ought to build up a glorious jubilee in the Christian. Knowing that the end is not. Someone said not long ago to me, he said, Brother Brandon, you, you scare the people when you talk about he might come in the next hour. I said, scare what people? Not his people. Amen. That's the greatest note that we can sound. Amen. That's what we're looking for. Behold, the bridegroom coming. Amen. Well, that's what we live for. That's the hour that we're all living for. I know nothing could be greater than that hour. But to the sinner, of course, it's a terrible thing. I was talking sometime... I'm in and out different places preaching, but somewhere I must have made this uh, remark, might have been here, but when a storm is coming up over a, a parched land and we can feel that cool breeze, we know that rain is fixing to come. It ought to make us happy to breathe because that air has come through the rain and it's just the fore announcement of the coming rain. And when Christians see the thing today happening, it's happening. It's the foreannouncing of the coming of the Lord. We can feel the breeze off of it. What a refreshing feeling to those that's not scared of a storm. To have a abiding place. Yes, drinking, hiding, builds up pressure. It doesn't let it off. A few days ago, I was in our city, and uh, our pastor, I've been looking for him, he's supposed to be here, Brother Neville, fine brother, we love him down our way, and uh, he was a Methodist, come from the Methodist school, of, and he invited me about 20 years ago down to preach for him one night at the Methodist church in a city below us. I'm standing there preaching and talking to him. I come back. I said to the church, you know what? I'm going to baptize him one of these days and God's going to give him the Holy Ghost. And he did. Now he's a pastor up there. He wasn't sick. He just so wore out. He couldn't go no further. I was trying to make my calls, and so I happened to have to pick up some of his. The office called and said, go over to the hospital and ask for a certain, certain woman. Brother Neville had to drive about 30 miles down or 20 miles down, 20 miles back. Go make these certs and such a call. I went out to the hospital, and they'd give me the, the lady's name, and her, I uh, said it's supposed to be, they thought, on a certain floor. That was on the third floor of the hospital. I walked out to the hospital and started down. There's a nurse standing there with a little mask hanging down. I said, good evening. 
And she never said a word. And I said, could you tell me where, if this lady uh, is in this place or not? I said, they told me she was to be in room uh, 331. She said, then go look. I said, thank you. <laughs> Pressure. I went down to the room and there's about four people in there. And I said, is Mrs. So-and-so here? No, sir, she isn't. Well, I thought maybe they might have meant 231. So I went to 231, I mean, uh, 321 instead of 31. They know nothing about her. I went back up and there was a little doctor sitting up there then. Real, I've ever seen a man that was as broad as he was high. It was that little fellow. And he was riding. And I come by, looked up, he kind of raised his eyebrow, looked, I thought, I've heard not seen nothing. So I went on up. I see it's all under pressure for some reason. And so um, I thought maybe it might be on the second floor instead of the third. So I went out to three, uh, third or second floor and I went to the nurse there and I said, lady, I'm a bit confused. I'm trying to make a sick call. I'm a minister. I said, could you tell me if this lady is in uh, they said 331, but maybe it's 231. She said, then go find out. And I said, yes, ma'am. Thank you for your information. Uh, went on down there and they said, no, she isn't here. So I come back and I come back again and I thought, well, I'll go back upstairs again. I went back up to the third floor and I started down. I thought maybe if that could be, and uh, maybe it was 320 or, or something. Well, I couldn't find where 320 was. And so coming down the hall was this little doctor with his stereoscope swinging him around. And I walked by and I said, good evening, sir. He never said a word. I said, could you tell me where 2 or 320 is? He said, this way and that way. I said, thank you for your information. What is it? Pressure. I went back down to the desk and there was another nurse. I thought I'll try it once more. I was a little shaky by that time. And a little reluctant to ask. And I said, lady, could you tell me some information? And I went through it again with her. And she said, just a moment, Reverend. I'll look on the chart. Oh, praise God. Uh, I'll let off some pressure. <laughs> so... She looked down. She said, oh, she has been changed. She's over in such and such rooms. I said, thank you very much. See, full of pressure. Doctors are that way. Nurses are that way. Psychiatrists are doctoring psychiatrists. <laughs> pressure. Something wrong. This seems to be so strange. The whole world going some way. They're nervous, doctor, and they're nervous. But you know, in all of it, the doctors doesn't have the answer. The hospital, the medics, they don't have the answer because they're nervous too. But there's only one that has the answer. That's God. He has the answer. Tension has always been with people. In the Old Testament, when Israel came over into Palestine and inherited the land, Joshua built houses which was called House of Refuge. That was where the people could go if they had killed someone or their enemy was chasing them. They could go to this uh house or city of refuge and could stand at the gate and could plead their case. And now, if they had did this on purpose, well, then there was no hope for them. It's just like today. Man is on a run. And what's he running from? 
What's the matter with him? He has no rest. He's just going like a madman. And in this Old Testament, if this man had did this on purposely, then he had no chance. But if he had not done it purposely, it would have been an accidentally. And there's so many people today that accidentally, they don't mean to do wrong. Now there's a hope for that person. If you want, if you are doing wrong and you don't mean to do wrong, there's a chance for you. There's a place for you. But if you just deliberately sin willfully and don't want no place of refuge, then there's nothing for you. When this man in the Old Testament, his slayers was after him. And that relatives of these people knew that if they ever could catch him, they would kill him because the law was tooth for tooth and eye for eye. So they had a right to kill him because he had done wrong. And if they ever caught up with him, of course, he was under pressure and he would run for his life. And he would take towards this place or city of refuge. And when he come to there, and if he went in, and he had told him a lie at the gate, the one who was at him could come and pull him away from the altar and slay him. But they, he could plead his case, and if he didn't mean to do it, then the pursuers had to stop at the gate. They couldn't come any farther. I'm so glad today that there is a place of refuge. For all this rush and hustle and bustle, we can let off the pressure and go in. Get out of it all. People are afraid of atomic bombs. They're afraid of fallout. When I was nearing your city down here, down here in this state, great big signs up, warning, fallout. Everybody's scared, trying to dig down in the ground to get away from it. You know, you know the only... All that you have to go down is just to your knees. You're sure to get away from it if you, if you just drop that far. You don't have to be a mole, go beneath the ground. Just go to your knees. That's all the part that you have to go. Now, but this man who comes must be willing first to, to accept the refuge. Now, if he doesn't care about the refuge, there's no place for him. But if he's willing, to accept the refuge, then there is a place provided for him. And so is it today. If you're sick, the doctor says you're going to die. Same thing he said about that baby. Others, cancer, whatever it is. And now, if you don't believe in divine healing, oh, then I don't know no place for you to go. But if you believe there is a fountain open, if you believe there is a place then I can tell you where there's a refuge, a house of refuge. No man wants to die. Nobody does. You want to live. And there is a place of refuge for you. God provided a place for you. A place of refuge where you can let off your worries, let off your strains, and be safe. Now, he must want to stay in this refuge. Now, when he gets in there, he doesn't, must not complain. He mustn't get in there and walk around and say, Oh, I wish I was out of here. If he does, he gets put out. You know, since I come into my Lord, I, I love him so much, I never want to go out. I, I, there's something about this salvation that since I come into him, he's my refuge. And when I come into him, I've never wanted to go out. I have no complaints. If I know it's going to be put out, then I'd have a complaint. But I have no complaints. I love him. I love his fellowship. I love those who have taken the same refuge. I love the fellowship with these that's in this refuge. Such a glorious fellowship around the Word of God. You must want to go out. For outside, he'll die. Inside, he's alive. Amen. I'm so glad that I'm inside. Amen. 
Oh, it's so good to be in here. For you're safe from death. Death cannot touch you in Christ. He's alive. And it's so glorious that we are baptized in that. I'm so thankful for it. A baptism in the refuge. Then when you come into the refuge, the one that was pursuing, he has to stop at the gate. Because the one that he was pursuing is safe. So no matter how fast he's running, when he gets into the refuge, he can just sit down and let off the steam. That's all. Let it off. He's safe. He don't have to worry no more. He's on the inside then. The gates are closed behind him. I'm so glad that we can be dead in our lives, hid in God's refuge. Safe forevermore. The poets that I've anchored my soul in a haven of rest. I'll sail the wild seas no more. The tempest may sweep over the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus I'm safe evermore. The waves can beat and baffle and sickness can come, death can come, or anything else, but you're safe evermore. Christ our refuge. God provided place of safety. Christ is the only Place of safety for those who wants to live. He's the only one that has eternal life. There's no church, no denomination, no president, no king, no pope, no bishop, no minister, no nothing can give you safety but Jesus Christ. He's the only place that can give you safety. And he's God's provided safety. Oh, we can provide this and provide that, and it'll fall. But when God provides anything, it's eternal. And that's God's provided way for our safety in Christ. I love it. When you're in Him, when troubles come like sickness or weary, disappointments, He bore our sorrows. With His stripes, we were healed. Everything that we have need of for the rest of the journey is right here in the refuge. How do we get in this refuge? By one spirit. We're all baptized into this refuge. And we become a member of this refuge. We are a citizen of this kingdom with our great provider with us that provides all we have need of. Just trust his word. And we, while we're in here, we're in his presence. I like that. Now, we don't have to hurry and scuffle and act like the rest of the world. Quieten down. What's the matter with the Christians? The spirit of the world today is neurotic. But that's not the spirit of Christ. Did you ever see him get excited about something? Just as calm as he could be. He knew exactly where he was standing. Oh, what a blessed assurance is. Just like a baby, to lay your trust upon him and let him take all your cares, for he cares for you. Don't try to do anything about it. He'll do it already. He's promised he would do it. It's his business. As long as you're fooling with it, well, then he can't have it. But when you turn it loose and let him have it, he'll take care of it for you. Yes, sir. Oh, I like that. What a perfect calmness a Christian ought to have. Let's take a look now at Israel for just an example. I promised myself not to stay here a long time tonight the platform like I have been doing. Let's take a look at Israel. The night of the Passover. Down in Egypt. That was the most horrible night that Egypt had ever saw. The night of the Passover, the death angel was in the land. Screams were coming from everywhere. People in the streets screaming, mothers pulling their hair. Their youngest, their oldest child had just died. Big black wings of the death angel was floating through the land. But Israel could sit just as calm as they could be. Wow! They were people, just like the Egyptians. 
but they had walked in God's provided way. They had accepted God's way of refuge. They had applied the blood to the door, and as long as they had walked in this way, God's provision, they didn't have to worry about any kind of a death angel or anything else because they were had the promise of God that the death angel would pass over. I can see a little boy as he looks out the window, and he runs back to his father, sitting reading the scroll, and saying, Daddy, little... Johnny Jones down the street that I played with, he's dead. His mother is in the street. And I look and the great wings of the killer is coming this way. I can see the old dad just as calm. Look at the son. And he said, Daddy, I'm your firstborn. And our house is next. How can you sit like that when you know that I'm the next one? I can see the old dad lay the scroll down, pick the little boy by the hand, walk over to the door, and said, You see that blood? But daddy, what power has that blood against that great black wings of death? Son, it's God's promise that he will see the blood of death. The only thing we have to do is a pot. Now, there could be a, a barrel of blood sitting at the door, and if it's not applied, it won't work. Amen. It had to be applied in God's provided way. Amen. That's the same as it is tonight. Amen. You don't apply the blood by talking about it. You apply the blood by accepting it. Amen. And getting on the little post of your own heart. Then you are free. The old dad wasn't scared. I can hear him say, son, just sit down. Let off the pressure. <laughs> Nothing's going to harm us. Just as calm as he could be. He promised that he would have seen the blood. They would pass over. He said, I've followed every instruction that the word of the Lord that came to the prophet told us to do. I followed that instruction just the way the prophet told us to do it. And I know that God's with the prophet because he's God's man. And the word of the Lord comes to our prophets. And therefore, he told us to apply this blood. He had thus saith the Lord, and I've done it, and I believe it, and I'm resting in it. Hallelujah. They might want you to join this and join that. That's all right. But to me, I just want the blood applied. <laughs> applied according to the instruction. If you just do the same thing now, then you can sit down and let off the steam. Yes, sir. But the people of this day, this uncertain age, run from one church to another, one denomination to another, proselyting, oh my, everything else. What are they doing? They're only building up a pressure. Some church can have a little meeting and, and a speaker comes there and they take their paper out of this church and take it over to that. Another comes along and has another kind of little meeting and they take it from that church over to this one here. Just packing it around. Why don't you just take the Lamb's blood and apply it the way that God said to it? Then you won't have to fool with the letter. Is this right or is that right? God's right. And if you've got the appropriated blood upon your heart, then you're right with God. Build up pressure. What makes them do it? Because they left him. They left his word. They accepted creeds. And all these things. Dogmas. Got away from the word. The word of the Lord is the name of the Lord, is the mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. The thing of it is, we don't try to run into the name of the Lord, but we try to run into the name of the church. And that's the reason we're sweating it out. But 
and building up pressure all the time because we have new denomination, new something, and we take off for it. And the first thing you know, we're all built up and don't know where we're standing. But the name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. It's the place of refuge. You don't join into it. You're born into it. You don't pack a letter into it. You're initiated by the Holy Spirit for you're circumcised from the things of the world and they are dead behind you and you are risen with them in His resurrection as new creatures in Christ Jesus. They left the Word. When you're just having joining a, a church, well, of course you can build up a pressure. But when you have been born into the kingdom of God, the pressure is gone. You see. Oh yes, his name is a tower, a great mighty tower of refuge. A, such a tower that when we come into it, he give us this assurance. Ask the Father anything in this great name of the tower, it'll be given to you. Watch it. Come into it. Be born into it. Then ask the Father anything you want to in that name and watch him honor it. What a consolation it is in this hour that when the peoples of the world, church members, running from place to place trying to find a refuge, and they say, well, this will say, well, you have to recite our creed. This will say you have to join to our church. But for that believer who comes into Christ calmly and receives the Holy Ghost and watch the very promise of God be made manifest among them. They don't have to run from here to there. They can just let off the steam. <laughs> right. Sit down. It's all over. Got it made then. Let off the pressure because you don't have to go run from church to church anymore because you are in it. The name of the Lord is a mighty tower. When the righteous run into it are safe. What kind of a tower? It's a tower of refuge where we can go in there. And that the word... The Lord is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again, if ye abide in me, the tower, my words abide in you. Now that's when you're on the inside. Not when you're out there looking in, but when you're in here looking out. When, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it'll be done for you. Now, if you don't believe that's the truth, come in one time and find out. Come in and be satisfied with what the Holy Spirit does. Don't find fault with it. Want to get back out again. Just come in and abide with Him. The name of the Lord, the Bible said, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. That's right. And the Bible said there's not another tower under heaven. Whereby you must be saved. Not another power, name, not another refuge. Our churches, our organizations, our societies, they're all all right. I have nothing against them. They do a great work. But when it comes to salvation, there's not another name under heaven given. But this great name of Jesus Christ. That don't mean just call it. That means come into it. Be in it. We're baptized into it. By one spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, we're all baptized into one body, which is Christ Jesus. Amen. I like it. It's a great and a great thing to me. Then while we're in this great tower, the fellowship we have. Isn't it wonderful to have fellowship with Christ? What more could we ask for? Now, Isaiah described him as a great rock. In a weary land, that's this land. A weary land or a weary time. We're living in a weary time where people are trying to dig holes underneath their house. Put a big tank in there. Well, don't you know if an atomic bomb would ever blast this place? Well, that would go so deep into the ground it'd break every bone in your body. Why, some of them bombs will blow a hole a hundred and 
or 150, 200 feet maybe deep and kill everything on top of the earth for, for 150, 200 miles around it. Blow a hole two or three hundred feet deep maybe and, and for a hundred miles around take everything and make it into volcanic ashes. If you were plumbed down to the center of the earth in the volcanic, it would still kill you. There's no escape, only up. Amen. Get away from it. Amen. Yes, sir. How do you get up? Go down first. That's right. How? Go down. Confess your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be buried in baptism with him and rise in his resurrection with the Holy Spirit that lifts you up above the cares and worries and unbelief of the world. Yes, that's it. The name of the Lord is a mighty tower, a mighty rock in a weary land. The righteous run into it and are safe. How we thank God for that. I was reading not long ago, and I like to read about wildlife. I was a conservation officer for years, and I've studied wildlife. Most all of you know about a, a, a rifle blowing up on me the other day. If it hadn't been for God, it would have killed me. Now, I'd just like to say something about that. That was too much pressure. <laughs> That's what done it. Let me give you a little lesson here. You know, the rifle was not original Weatherby rifle. As I've said that I had friends would have bought me one, I always wanted one, but I, I, I wouldn't let them do it because it cost more than any other rifle. And a fine Christian businessman gave my boy uh, Model 70 uh, Winchester and Billy is left handed and it's a right handed bolt and he couldn't use it. So I give him my old Savage 300 and I took his rifle because I was right handed. And so then it was a 257 Roberts to you brothers who hand load and old guns. And then a, a friend of mine come along and said, Brother Branham, you never would let us buy you a Weatherby. Now, Weatherby can bore that out and make it a Weatherby for just a little bit of money. It cost you $30. Cost me about 10 or 15. Said, let him bore it out. Let me have it done for you. Well, he's such a wonderful brother. I said, go ahead, take it. Well, he went and bored it out and I put a shell in it and shot it like to kill me. Now, here's what it was. If that would have been a Weatherby Magnum to begin with, it never would have blown up. Or why? It at the beginning would have been started on those dials. It would have correctly been a Weatherby Magnum. But then it was something else and tried to make something out of it that it wasn't, it blowed up. And that's what's the matter today with the Christians. That's exactly. There's so many people that try to impersonate Christianity. They get excited. They go out and try to act like a Christian. What happens? The first little pressure comes along, you blow up. Amen. But if you'd have went back to the beginning and been born again of the Spirit of God, you can stand the pressure because it was sent to you. You must start from death to life. You must die, go into the scrap heap. Be molded over. You don't you want to blow up somewhere. I was reading here not long ago. I preached a subject called The Eagle Stirreth Its Nest in Chicago. I was reading about a certain kind of an eagle. There's 40 different kinds of them, they claim. It means a ripper with the beak. God always likens his people to eagles. He calls himself Jehovah Eagle and his little eaglets. That's those who are born of him. And I made a little rude illustration many times on that. How that, how the eagle gets her little ones ready to fly and takes them up in the air and turns them loose. And if a crow tried to get up there, every feather would fall out of him. He's not pressurized to it. See, he couldn't stand the pressure. But the eagle is the only bird that's born with that kind of a feather that can go so high to a hawk couldn't even come around. And he's got eyes. And higher you go, the further you can see. 
And what good would it do him to get up there if he didn't have eyes to see way away? He couldn't see back where he come from. And that's the way with a Christian. Some of the people maybe got a buzzard disposition, <laughs> eating the things of the world and the vulture, and try to fly up there with an eagle. Why, he, he blows up. <laughs> it's too much pressure. You've got to be made for it. Amen. And this certain kind of an eagle, when he begins to get old, he gets weary like all of us old people. And he gets a crust over his head. And he gets so weary, he don't know what to do. And now the Bible said that the eagle renews his youth. So I studied about this fellow. And when he gets old and weary and that crust all over his head, he flies just as high as he can go till he finds a great high rock. He sits down by the side of this rock and he sits there and beats his head on this rock. What's he trying to do? Beat the crust off. All the crust. And the blood will fly out of his head. He goes through all kinds of torture. But as long as he can feel some of the crust on him, he's got to get that off. So he beats it on the rock. Just keeps beating till all the crust is off his head. And as soon as all of his crust is off his head, though he's bleeding, wounded, he just screams to the top of his voice. He lets off the pressure. Why? Because as soon as all that crust is off, then he renews his youth. It's sure to come. So he, as soon as all the crust is gone, he can start screaming because he knows that he's got rid of all the crust. So his youth is sure to be renewed. So he can just let off the pressure, start screaming because he's going back to the young eagle again. That's wonderful. I'm glad for the eagle. I'm glad for that bird. But you know, I know a rock. Where that we can go and be in prayer till all the crust of the world is beat away from us. Till all the unbelief in God's word is beat away. Till we enter into a place where all things are possible. And as soon as we got all the world and unbelief and God's word beat off of us, then we can scream and shout because eternal life is sure. Just as certain as Certainly. Because all the world is beat off. If you keep the world on to you, keep loving the world and the things of the world, you're sure to die. But if you can get away from all of that, then your youth will be restored. You'll have eternal life. So glad of that. I was reading sometime about the uh, Mitzvah of Proclamation when the slaves of colored brethren and sisters in the South when they used to have slavery. And when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, they'd been whipped and beaten, so forth, and been slaves. And you know what happened? They said a certain morning, I don't remember the date just now, but that's the morning that you're going to be free, and you'll be free at sunup. When the sun rises, all the slaves could go free. Those poor, decrepit, hard-beaten slaves were so anxious to be free till the strongest of them climbed way up the top of the hill. The women and the weaklings come on down. One's not quite so strong, climb down a little farther. And the women and the children and the great big huskies that was able to go all the way to the top. They stood there before day and they looked and they looked until after a while they began to see the streaks of the sun rising. It was still dark in the valley. They relayed it down. One hollered from the top, we are free. The next one hollered down, we are free. All the way down to the valley. We are free. The sun's up. They can let off the pressure and scream and shout to the top of their voices because they were free. The sun was up. That was the S-U-N. Oh, brother. Now, 
The S-O-N is up. We are free. Hallelujah. The signs of His resurrection is right among us. Jesus Christ is saved yesterday, today, and forever. He is not dead, but He's alive forevermore. The sun is up. We can shout and praise God. The sun is up, and we live. He's with us, in us, vindicating His presence. Amen. There's these great resurrection signs and wonders. The S-O-N is up. The slaves to sin and church denomination, church entity, and all those things, you are free. The Son of God has raised with healing in His wings. And the sun is up. I'm so glad of it. One time up in Kentucky... Up in the mountain country where I come from, I was preaching. And I, early in the afternoon, I was preaching on hellfire and brimstone for the unbeliever. There's an old logger sitting back there. And I said, all oh, you drunkards, and he was one. I said, you better repent. Get right with God. There'd been a fellow coming the night before that was cutting corn. And he had a a big nail sticking in his overhaul. He said, we'll go up there. I've been preaching for about a year. He said, we'll throw that little preacher out the window. So he's come at the door. Someone come told me, he said, that's the roughest bunch there is around here. Standing there, great, big, burly looking fella. His arms crossed, beard hanging on his face, about 30 years old. Oh, he was a mean looking man. And he kept looking at me. I just kept preaching right on. Repent or perish! He stayed a little too long. The Holy Spirit got a hold of him. He fell in the floor. He couldn't get to the altar quick enough. He come with his hands up over his head crying, God be merciful to me. The next night his little child sat back there. His little girl handed me a little bunch of flowers when I come in the door. She said, Brother Bill, we got a new daddy at home. I want to show you that I love you for coming up here and letting Jesus make a new daddy for us. And this old drunk sitting there, and I said, all you drunkards, all you sinners, repent! And he got angry, and he got up and went home. He went to bed. I was staying down to my grandfather's house. And so then, while I was having the meeting, and up there we'd you'd go across the hills with a lantern in their hand. And so when, along about midnight, this old fellow come down. He was beating on the door. And I said, open the door. He said, Brother Branham, I want you to pray for me. He said, I had the office dream a while ago. And he said, I, I just can't stand it through the night. I said, what's the matter? He said, I, I dreamed that I was a rabbit. And he said, I was sitting out in the field, just eating clover and having a big time. And was doing as I pleased. And I said, after a while, I heard a ball of a hound. And said, the hound was right on me. I said, I took out to run, but said the hound was faster than me. And said, I happened to turn and look, and there was a big rock that I'd heard about. And said, in that rock was a, a hole. And said, I know if I could only beat that hound to that hole, I'd be safe. But if I couldn't beat it, he would have me. And said, Brother Branham, as I was running for all that was in me, Knowing any minute I'd be gobbled up because I could feel the hot breath of the hound as he jumped on my heels and said all at once when he made the grab, I slipped in the hole. And said when I got in, I sat down, let off the pressure. <laughs> That's it. He is a rock in a weary land. There's a cleft in the rock for sinners. Unbelief, just run into the rock and be safe. Christ is our rock. People today run after everything else but Christ. Yes, amen. They run after denominations. They run after sensations. Everybody's got blood, fire, smoke or something and people run after it. Why don't you take his word? For he is the word. Run into that and you're safe because heavens and earth will pass away. But my word shall not pass away. Yes, sir.
Today it's always something they got to do. They'll run to a creed. They'll join and unjoin and everything else from one to another. But they won't try to take Christ. Amen. Watch him as he vindicates himself. That all builds up pressure. You must let it off. Just believe his word. How do I get it, Brother Branham? St. John 5, 24, Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him and sent me has everlasting life. Yeah. Shall not come into the judgment. It's passing death unto life. That's what Jesus said. Acts 2, 38, Peter said, Repent, every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the refuge. Yeah. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. For it's for you and your children and them that are far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's the place to come. Mark 16 said, These signs shall follow them that believe. You know what, what's on the inside of that? You know what the results is? When you do this, you've passed from death into life. And you have eternal life. And you can let off the pressure. Why not let it off? People so upset, so bothered. Just let the pressure off. There's a land beyond the river. There's a refuge. And that refuge is Christ. Today, we don't have to wonder about it. We know it's the truth. When God makes a promise in his Bible and we see it fulfilled, then we know that it's the truth. There's nothing more can be done. Now, how do you know that this day when the great uh, conglomeration of everybody's got this and that, this and that, but when we know that God gives signs, the signs on the road. If you didn't have a signpost, you wouldn't know where you were going. You can't take a road map and go unless you got a signpost to see where you're going. Amen. This is the road map. Amen. This is the one that tells us whether we're right or not. Amen. Jesus said, these signs in Mark 16 will point the way. Jesus said in John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. More than this shall he do, because I go to the Father. That's the refuge. In other words, if you come into him, his nature and his life will be in you, and you can feel it, you can see it, and it'll produce just exactly the life that the Bible said it would produce. If you bought a vine, and it was a grapevine, and that grapevine went forth, and it produced a branch off of it, and that branch had grapes on it, now, how are you going to get the next vine with a pumpkin on it? And the next vine comes off of it, it's going to ask something else. If it is, it's a grafted vine. And that's what's the matter today. we got too many grafted things called the church of Christ. we got too many grafts. It only bears the record of itself. Here a few weeks ago, I was speaking on an international broadcast for the Full Gospel Businessman in California. And when I did, I was speaking on a tree that I saw at Brother Sherrod's ranch in Phoenix. I think it had nine different kinds of fruit on it. And it was an orange tree. Now I said, I want to ask you something, Brother Sherrod. I said, now there is a grapefruit, and there is a, a tangerine, a tangelo, and a lemon. Oh, I don't know how many citrus fruits was on that tree. And I said, that tree... How did them get there? He said, well, I grafted them. They're all citrus, so I grafted them. I said, now, next spring or the next time it bears, it being originally an uh, orange tree, then it will bring forth all these branches or bring forth oranges. He said, no, no. Mm -hmm. No, it'll bring forth what kind of branch it's in. He said, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a lemon branch in an orange tree, yet it'll bear lemons. And said, if it's a if it's a, a tangerine branch, it'll bear tangerines living on the same line. I said, then it'll never bear no more oranges. He said, oh yes. When the original tree puts forth one of its original branches, it'll bear oranges. I said, praise be to God. That's it. Jesus said in John 14, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. And... The first branch that come forth out of that vine, they wrote a book of Acts behind it. Right. 
And today we have denominations living on the name of Christianity, but only bearing denominational fruit. Yeah. Right. But if that vine ever puts forth another branch, yeah. you're right a book of Acts behind it. If the Spirit of Christ is in the church, well, it will do the works of Christ. Jesus said so. Then we can let off the steam, let off the pressure. You don't have to run from church to church. Just come to Christ. What did he do? How did we know him? What would he be if he is here in the city tonight? What would he do if he stood here? He would tell you of a place Fear not, the first thing at the resurrection. Fear not. Don't be all upset. I'm he that was dead and is alive again. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. We would know him. And that's how we know him today, because he walked one day after the resurrection down a road. All with some friends going to Emmaus, Theopius, and his friend. And he talked to them all day long. They didn't know him. But when he got in the building that night in the little inn, when he sat down, their eyes were blinded to it. And then he did something just like he did before his crucifixion. And by that sign that he did, the same way he did it before he was crucified, they recognized that it was him. That's what brought their eyes open. Now, isn't that just the same today? Amen. Now we're at the end time when he promised that this uh, this vine will bring forth another branch. He promised it at the end time. And here we are at the end time. I'm going to get the budding of that branch in the morning, the Lord willing. But here we are at the end time with the same Jesus. Now, one will say join this, other say go this, and everything. You're still building pressure. You don't know where you're at. Why not just come to that refuge? Why not just come to him and see if it's right? Take him at his word. Believe him. There is Christ in the building tonight. Christ promised this. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. Is that right? Well, then, if that isn't right, then the book is wrong. It told something that he didn't say. But now... How would you place your confidence in where the book was right? If the book's right and says that, then take him at his word and the, the Holy Spirit will vindicate that that's the truth. Amen. That's God said something. God can prove something. Any man can say what he wants to, but that doesn't make it right. But when God comes around and proves that it's right, that makes it right. Amen. Amen. Do you believe? Amen. Are you in that refuge? You have a right to every privilege that God has if you're in there. You believe that? Amen. Are you happy to be in this refuge? Amen. Can you just sit back and let off the pressure? Say, thanks be to God. I finally made it. I am here by the grace of God. I'm in the safety zone. Nothing can harm me now. I'm protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. A company of angels are around me. The angels of God are encamped about those. They don't leave. They stay there day and night. Are encamped about those who fear Him. And you have a refuge. You can come into it at every privilege. And what a time it is to be in this refuge and have fellowship with Him. I believe if we would ask Him tonight, if we could have a little fellowship with His presence, I believe He would do it for us. Don't you? I believe He would. Now, to you that has that desire a while ago that you raised your hand, I wonder tonight if you would just fellowship with him and that desire for a few minutes. And if you're in that refuge, you can touch him because he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of your infirmity. If you're in that refuge, you can do it. Now, I believe last night we come down and give out prayer cards. How many of you are sick wants to be prayed for? Let's see your hands. Raise up your hands everywhere. Oh, we couldn't run a line without cards. That's See, we couldn't do it because it'd be a scramble and over one another. But let's let's just stop a minute. Remember, that little baby we just prayed for. In less than 24 hours, God had come on the scene till he even astonished the doctor. Yeah. Sure. He's God. 
He heals the sick. Now, if you knew that Jesus was standing right by the side of you, do you believe if you had touched him that he would heal you like the woman did that had the blood issue? Do you believe that? Well, now, if the Bible here tells us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, let's us just pray and say, Lord, I've come into this refuge. I'm your servant. And now I'm afflicted with something or there's something wrong with me. Can I touch you? If it's my faith, if I got faith enough to touch you, then speak back to me. Now, Brother Branham doesn't know me and I don't know him, but you know both of us. And I believe that the Bible says that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we're baptized into you, and in there you have offices to operate your great church for the perfection, to get all the doubt. I'm going to be the eagle tonight. I'm going to sit against this rock and beat all the unbelief has gone from me. When I feel all the unbelief is gone, confess all my sins, and say, Lord God, now you say, Brother Bram, I don't smoke, drink, chew, commit adultery. That, that ain't it. That's not sin. That's the attribute of sin. That's the attribute of unbelief. See, if you believed, you wouldn't do that. See, no, that ain't what sin is. People can, uh, unbelief is sin. He that believeth not is condemned already. See, that's just the attribute of unbelief. But if you can beat all that away from me, say, Lord God, I believe just exactly what your word said. And I believe, as we preached last night, that the appearing of the Lord comes before the coming of the Lord. Of course, it's two different words altogether. Now the appearing, as he promised in the last days, that he'd be with us. And what a refuge and what a consolation it is, Christians, that we can stand here tonight in the presence of God, in the face of his word, and the uh, impossibilities that he's promised in here, we can see manifested right before us. What a wonderful thing. If that isn't a refuge, if that isn't a haven of rest, I don't know what would be. To see Jesus, he said, the works that I do, shall you do also. Oh, what a promise that is. Now, how many believe it? That's the truth. Amen. All right. Amen. Now let us pray. Our heavenly Father, thou art God, I pray that you will grant tonight the things that people are asking for. And I pray that you will show yourself alive to give consolation. A while ago when I asked for believers to raise their hand, Father, as far as I could see, it was 100% that all of them was believers. Many, most all of these people, I'm stranger to. But Lord, you know them. Now I have told them that, that there is a refuge, a tower, a, a rock in a weary land a place in a weary land now that where we can come to and be safe. The Bible said the name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Now, to assure the safety, Lord, when the people will know that it isn't denominational safety, it's the Holy Spirit, the blood safety that we come into. Let this be known tonight, Lord, that you are still Jesus, that you've raised from the dead, that you are now a great high priest that's making intercessions for, uh, for anything that we ask for. We believe that you promised us that if we would ask anything in your name, it would be done. You promised that if we would abide you and, all, and your words in us, then we could ask what we wanted to and it'd be granted to us. We know that thou keep us thy promise, Lord. And I pray that you will vindicate your presence tonight. And we ask you, Father, to grant the same things to happen here tonight before the people, just like it did before your crucifixion, that they might know after 2,000 years that Jesus is not one day older. He's the same Christ that he always was. He can never fail or never change. I pray that you'll give them consolation and grant tonight, Father, that them knowing that we are just human beings and these things would be impossible for a human being to do, but God promised to do it to his, his church, his called out, the ones that were under the blood. Grant it, Father. And if there's some in here tonight that's not under the blood, may quickly and sweetly, may they ask for that privilege. And I'm sure it will be granted. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A church, you who are sojourning, I don't speak of denomination, 
I speak of you people in the denomination, which is the church. I ask this, that there a man can come by and say anything he wishes to. But unless it comes from the Bible, I'd be a little skeptic of it. Amen. Now, God can do anything he wants to do. He's God. I'm no one to say that he doesn't do it. He takes care of his own business. I can't even take care of mine. But I depend on him. But what if he promises and it's a Bible sign, like in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. If they would take up serpents or drink deadly things, it would not harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Jesus Christ the same yesterday day and forever. A little while and the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me. For I, personal pronoun, will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. And the works that I do shall you do also. That's Bible signs, friend. That's believers that's passed from death to life. The Bible says that he is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Now, if you have infirmity tonight, or you know someone who has infirmity tonight, if you just pray and believe God. If you just ask right now. I believe God, by his Holy Spirit, in the midst of us here. Now, friends, we see this. Many of you have seen it done. But the trouble with the American people, we've seen it too much. It's too common to us now. An old sailor was coming from the sea one day, and he met a man going down, a poet, who had wrote about the sea, but he had never seen him. And he said, where goest thou, my good man? He said, I'm going to the sea. He said, oh, I am wrote of it what I've read. He said, now I'm going to learn of it. He said, I'm going down to experience it. I, oh, I, my heart is thrilled. He said, I want to smell its briny waves. I want to see its licking and uh, waves in the air. I want to hear the gulls holler and see the blue skies reflect themselves in its water and its white caps as it dances. He is a poet. So he could really express it. And the old sailor said, I don't see nothing so thrilling about it. So I was born on it more than 40 years ago. See, he had seen it so much till it become common to him. That's what's the matter with the full gospel people. But the hour will soon come where you'll cry for it and then won't see it. Let it never become old to you. Let not the Holy Spirit ever become old to you. May it always be fresh and new. May the act of God thrill my soul. I'm amazed each night, each day, as I walk along and see him as he tells things and see it happen just the way that he says it will happen. How that he'll predict it months before it comes to pass and watch it just exactly, never one iota fail. His word cannot fail. He's God. And what a refuge that is. What a consolation to know that we're not children that's tossed about not knowing where we're going. We know where we're going. Amen. God promised Amen. it. He vindicates his promises. And people might tell you that we're just too emotionally. It is an emotion. Of course, it, in one way it is emotion. But anything that hasn't got emotion is dead. So if your religion has got a little emotion about it, you better bear it. Because it, it's dead. So it certainly is thrilling. When Jesus came to into Jerusalem, the people screamed and shouted until people said, make them hold their peace. He said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will immediately cry out. The Son of God was on the road. And something has to come out in its presence. Now, the Son of God is here tonight. I believe that. I'm not a Son of God. I am adopted Son of God like you are. I'm a potion of His Spirit. And if His Spirit is in me, if I told you I had the spirit of John Dillinger, you'd expect me to have guns and be an outlaw. If I told you the spirit of an artist was in me, you'd expect me to paint the pictures. If I told you the spirit of some great soldier, you'd expect me to know all the arms and the everything, because his spirit is in me. If I tell you the spirit of Christ is in me, then I should do the works of Christ. Live the kind of life that he lived. A sacrifice life for the people. That is right. I think of the time when the prophet went to the people when they wanted to make themselves like the rest of the people. That's where they made a sad mistake. When they wanted a king, they wanted to act like the rest of the people. It's too bad that we ever put denomination in Pentecost, Amen. breaking down the bars. And it's too bad. It cut off the other fellow. 
And we ought to want to act like the rest of the churches. We are a born again group of people. We are free. We are bound down by no man's creeds. We are free in Christ. Now, but it was too bad they did it. But we're still free by God's grace. And he's with us tonight. We don't have to be tossed about saying, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and do that. We just see Christ come among us. And what a consolation it is to see the very same Christ that promised, I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the road, into the world, and come right down and prove himself among us. Isn't that wonderful? Making himself the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's not many people in here that I know. You sick people, you would have a desire on your heart. And know that I don't know you or know your desire. Raise up your hand. Well, it's just everywhere. All right? I don't have no control of this. It has control of me. But if it would happen to come over somebody that does know me, and somebody that I have met or something and know them, and they're from Jeffersonville or somewhere, then you mention it. But I want to ask you something. When our Lord Jesus stood here on the earth, and looked over his audience, a little woman touched his garment one day, and he turned around and said, who touched me? He didn't know who it was. The little woman might have been sitting down like you or, or out there. And what did he do? He said, he found her. See, he, she could not be hid. And he said, thy faith has saved thee. Told her her blood issue had stopped because she had touched him. Now, she did that herself. Now, the Bible said that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. When St. Peter came to him, just an old rude fisherman, they were told he didn't even have enough education to write his own name. But yet it pleased God to give him the keys to the kingdom. That's right. Because of his faith, he had a revelation of who he was. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Now, Jesus is not dead. He's a living, a high priest. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's the same high priest, if you touched him, he'd act the same way. Is that right? Amen. Now, he promised these things would be dead. I believe in the Bible. I believe that that is the complete Word of God. I don't believe we have to go out of that Bible to get anything that ever divine promise is in there. I believe it with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all that's in me. I believe it. I may not have faith enough to make every promise come to pass, but I certainly won't stand in the path of those who do it, does have the faith that believe it. I want you to believe it with all that's in you. Now, each and every person, if Christ will come into our midst by the Holy Spirit and will have you, your his children, the blocks that's in the temple, you know, today we hear so much about, just like it was in the early days, there's so much membership. We got to draw so many members. Word into sons and daughters of God. That's it. Amen. We need the masonry Amen. of God's Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Amen. Hebrews uh, 4, 12. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Listen, the Word. How many believe that in the beginning was the Word? That's First, it was a thought. And it has to be a thought. Then when it's expressed, it becomes a Word. And then in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God when He spoke it. And the Word become flesh and dwelt among us. Now, that was Jesus. When He was here on earth, He discerned the thoughts of the people. That's what made all true believers know that he was a prophet that Moses had spoke of would be raised up. They hadn't had a prophet for hundreds of years. I believe it's time again that the Bible promises that in the last days that spirit will come up on the earth and will restore the faith of the children back to the Pentecostal fathers again, back to the original faith. I believe it's the evening lights. I believe that it's here. I believe that Spirit of God, that Christ, is here tonight. Amen. And I ask you as my friend and my brother and sister, you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is present. And when you believe that, touching with your infirmity, by your faith to believe it, and say, Lord God, if that man, he doesn't know me, I don't know him, he doesn't know me. But if he's told me the truth, then let 
your spirit speak through his lips and let me touch you and you confirm it through his lips like the woman did when she touched the hem of his garment. And that day you touch his garment for he can be touched by your faith like that woman. Maybe not physical, but like that woman. Would it make you have joy and be happy in the refuge if, it, if you could, would see him do it? Raise your hands if you believe it. Thank you. Now, Father, that's all I know to say. I'm trying to tell them of a safe place where they can just rest. And God, in here is healing. In here is a rock that all the unbelief can be beat off with. The rock of the word. And may the word come forward now and be made flesh among us. And it's said it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces down into even the sunder and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. A discerner of the thoughts of the heart. If ye abide me in my word and you, then ask what you will. Lord, I've been turned out, run over, run down. But I've tried to stand faithful. I'm happy to do it by your word. Let it ever abide in my heart. And before this audience tonight, which I'll stand again at someday, if no more on earth, at the day of that great day when Jesus comes, I have know that your word is true. Help me, O oh Lord, that I might be able to be used tonight. And if, I know I'm not a theologian, Father. You never call me for that. But... I pray that you'll let the ministry that you gave me to bless the people with come forward now. In the name of Jesus Christ, may the word come and pierce down into here and discern the thoughts of the heart that the people might know that the word of God is abiding in us. In Jesus' name, I ask it for God's glory. Amen. Look this way. Now I'm saying this like Peter and John that passed in the gate beautiful. He said, look on us. That's what I'm asking you to do. Look this way, not at me, but what I've said. Whatever that you have a desire in your heart for, you believe that God will give it to you. You say, Lord Jesus, let me touch you. How many in this building has ever seen the picture of that light? The angel of the Lord, what hangs here in Washington? I am your brother. That light, if you can see it, is hanging not two feet from me right now. Just believe. If you cannot see it, see, pray, and see if God won't vindicate that light. If that light is that same light that met Paul on the road down to Damascus, he said, I'm Jesus. He had returned back to God, back to spirit. The word was made flesh. He come back to the word. If that's the same light. It'll produce the same kind of a life. Same act. See it? This lady sitting right here. Are we strangers to one another, lady? I don't know you. I've never seen you. Do you believe me to be his servant? Do you believe the words that I have preached is the truth? And we are total strangers to one another. You're just, as far as I know, a woman's walked in sat down there. But she was believing for something. You're trying to find something from God. And if I be a servant of God, and I've told the truth of God... And God's word and truth abiding in here, it'll produce itself. It'll declare it. You'll know whether it's the truth or not. You're praying for someone. It's your child. It's that little girl sitting right there. And that little girl, you believe he'll tell me what's wrong with her? Would it help you? She's got heart trouble. If you will believe with all your heart and walk down there and lay your hands on that child. Go down there. Lay your hands on that child. The womb that bore her to this earth. The hand of the mother lays on the child. Lord, if she had faith enough to touch your garment, 
then I come with the sword of God for the word of God to perform an operation. Come out, Satan, I cut you free with the word of God of a promise that these signs shall follow them that believe. Leave the girl in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You believe she'll live and be well? As you have believed, so will it be. Now, I ask somebody to question the woman. Ask her if every word was said is true. I know not the woman. I've never seen her, know nothing about her. But what was said is true. What about somebody through here? How about you believing? Let's get at least two or three for a witness. I'm happy to be in this refuge. I'm safe forevermore. I love him. How sweet it is to trust in Jesus. What a challenge to a people. He promised it'll be light in the evening time. There'll be a day that won't be day or night. It's been a, a day of gloom, just enough to walk and accept. But in the evening time, it shall be light. Little lady, you're just as conscious as you can be that something happened. I'm looking right at it. That light settled right over you. I'm looking at it. I've never seen you before. I guess we're strangers to one another. If that's right, raise up your hand. There's a dark shadow around you. It's a shadow of death. You're suffering with a, a tumor. That tumor is on your breast, both breasts. A great percent of your breasts are covered with tumor. You have one hope. If you have faith enough to touch him to do a thing like that, you're a fine person. I have a good contact with the Spirit with you. You believe me to be his prophet? You know I don't know you. You know this. You're conscious that a real sweet feelings all around you. That's that light, that glow of light. You're not from here. You're from away from here. Birmingham. I see that banana market there. Your name is Miss Vincent. That is true. Have faith in God. Now, at this time, lady, it's gone from you. That shadow that was over you has left. Now, don't you doubt. You'll get well. I ask anybody to come question the woman. Find out. There would be a doctor present. Why not come ask and examine? You're a little skeptic, which I know it's present, so. <laughs> so why not say it? I used to call that out, but it hurts too many feelings. What about somebody in here? Some of you way back, somewhere, have faith. I cannot do this. You do it. I'm only trying to represent him, reflecting like an mirror to you, making my life his mirror, that he might reflect himself. You know, I don't know these things and couldn't do them. I, you just have faith and don't doubt. Believe. Right back here, it's a man. It's over a man. He's suffering with a nervous condition. I hope you don't miss it. He's from Pennsylvania. God help me. Mr. Carnes, 
Stand up on your feet. I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you. If them things are true, raise up your hand. Go home, you're well. Jesus Christ makes you You believe in God? Believe all sort I've told you the truth about Jesus Christ. His present. I believe that's three rows. Well, we got one more. Let's get over here. How about some of you in there? Will you believe? How many suffering needs help from God? And you believe that you don't know, you know what? I don't know your condition. Raise up your hand and say, it's me. I, I'm believing. It's just everywhere. Have faith in him. This little fellow sitting here with his hand up. You didn't know you had that much faith, did you? If you've got faith in it, in your condition, to call God on the scene, don't you never take another drop of whiskey as long as you live, and don't never smoke another cigarette. Believe God, and you'll be made well. Will you accept it? Will you believe it? All right. Then go and God make you well. Let's say praise the Lord. Do you believe he shared? How many of you would like to confess your unbelief and would like to say, God, be merciful to me in the presence of the Holy Ghost. I know that there's no man on earth could do those things. Be merciful unto me. Confess your wrong. Say to God, I have, I have been unconcerned, Lord. I now want to enter into this great fellowship. I want to enter into this refuge. I'm going to believe you with all my heart. Raise up your hand and say, God, it's me. It's me. I'm, I'm at the end of the road. I, I want to be made right. Do you believe it? Confess your sins now. Let's pray. Each one of you pray in your own way. Lord Jesus, we are human beings, Lord. We are ready to confess our sins. I'm confessing the sins of this people. I'm confessing my own sins. We have disbelieved too much, Lord. The hours are growing dark. The Son of God is soon to arrive. With, and I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll forgive our sins. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will now take every unbelief away from us. Oh, if He could only get into our heart, there would be another day of Pentecost. That would be such a, a condition in this church and this group of people tonight till it be noise and brought all around the country by morning. Holy Spirit, break over a barrier of sin. May it come through like the jet plane beyond the sin barrier and shake every shackle of unbelief. May ever evil beat his head against the rock of ages until the Holy Ghost takes complete control. Satan, you are lost. You lost the battle. And in the name of Jesus Christ, leave this audience. Come out of them for the glory of God. Now that you have confessed your sins, now that you believe, do you believe that you have beat every shackle off of your understanding? That nothing hinders you. There's not one thing in your way, but you believe you're free. You believe that all the unbelief is gone from you. You believe that you're now in that haven of rest. You believe all the pressure. Will I be healed? Can I be healed? You're already healed. Brother Ben, if you'll lay your hands on me, my hands ain't got nothing to do with it. It's His hand. If you're a sinner, you've already been saved. Just believe it, accept it, and act on it. If you're sick, you're already healed. Would God stand here and do a thing like that and let a hypocrite that somebody don't know what they're talking about come here and would, would vindicate a, a liar, would vindicate a hypocrite? God doesn't deal with sinners. God deals with truth and His Word is the truth. Now I've told you the truth. And friends, I say tonight, if you believe what I've told you, there won't be a feeble person among us. 
Every one of you are healed by his stripes. You're already healed. By his stripes we were healed. Do you believe it? Now you either believe in laying on of hands. You raise your hands, you us believers. Then lay your hand on somebody in front of you in the seat. Lay your hand over there. You want the Bible doesn't say the hands of William Branham. The Bible doesn't say the hands of Owen Roberts. The Bible said these signs shall follow them that lead. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now you pray. You pray. You confess. Confess your wrong. Tell God that you believe him. And you can every one be made perfectly whole at this hour. Believe him. Hallelujah. sick you are, who you are, where are you from? I challenge you in the name of Jesus Christ, if you meant that from your heart, stand up on your feet and accept it. No matter who you are, what you are, stand up. That's it. Get up. Amen. Rise up. Everywhere. There you are. Pray big hold on. Yeah. 